Hello everybody, uh, this is Fyrimaster Ingvar Johannesson from Iceland and yes this is me, uh, this is my ugly mug uh, this picture was taken about two weeks ago when I was playing in the Icelandic League and this game is indeed analyzed in the Master Hangout it was the Benoni game against uh, Arnason a very nice game but that's not what this video is about this is my uh, submission to the video contest and this video is about patterns and pattern recognition and well this is uh, sort of uh, an introduction and first in a series uh, I'm gonna basically uh, teach and show and collect uh, patterns and uh, this is how I intend to uh, categorize them it will be made patterns Tactical patterns, strategical patterns, uh, technique patterns, and endgame patterns. Although I don't have any endgame patterns in this video. So, uh, on we go. Our first pattern, that's a mate pattern, and it's called Anastasia mate. Uh, onto the chessboard, and this is. Uh, sort of to demonstrate uh, uh, the mate in its purest form and in this mate uh, these three pieces will cooperate to form the mate first we go knight e7 check the king has only one square and of course after this check we notice that the knight is blocking this square as well as this one uh, and indeed we follow up with queen takes h7 check this has to be captured and rook h5 is checkmate so this is Anastasia's mate I have no idea why it's called that but generally it's just called that and I think it's ni nice to have a have a name to associate with these, these patterns to uh, refer to them in the future uh, let's go on I have another example uh, no, don't want to save uh, well this is uh, this is an opening an opening theory uh, a Spanish game knight takes e4 rook e1, knight c5 uh, Black takes the opportunity to uh, capture the bishop. We take on e5. Uh, main line is take on c3, but if we. Uh, no, sorry, take on e5, but if we take on c3. Knight takes e6 check, bishop e7. Knight takes e7, a very nice move, and if he takes the queen, check. He has to uh, interpose the queen, and then we take with the knight. And. Uh, this is winning for white. The material is equal, but uh, there's no way out for this knight. And we're also threatening a uh, discovered check here and here as well. So, okay, just uh, going off topic a little bit. Okay, but on we go. Rook takes e5 check, bishop e7. Uh, black has a piece up for the moment, but after knight d5, it's clear that we will uh, re uh, recover the piece. Seems logical to castle here, uh, but what happens now? Knight takes e7 check, king h8, queen h5, uh, and well, after seeing the mate pattern in its uh, original and, and clear, uh, clear form, uh, we know what white is threatening. But after the logical move d6, uh, black fell for it anyway. Queen takes h7, king takes h7, rook h5, checkmate. And this is uh, surprisingly common, and I'll be the first one to admit that about seven years ago on ICC, I was playing black in a, in a similar line, and my opponent blitzed this out, beat me, mated me, and, and then I got the message theory. <laughs> so it was not a common, not a comfortable feeling to lose like that, but uh, I've gotten people back with a similar line uh, without a6 but it, it 
comes to the same. One more thing I'd like to add, uh, well, nothing. It's not uh, related to the pattern, but after g6, queen h6, g6 still doesn't work because we have rook h5. The mate on h7 can't be defended unless by g takes h5, and we have queen f6 mate. Uh, okay. And one more example. Uh, here it's black to move. And this is from a game between uh, Andrenko and Kalininia. Uh, both rated around 2100. And White's last move was Queen to c5. And White overlooked the simple threat of Anastasia's made by Rook e2, check, King h1. Takes and checkmate. So, this was Anastasia's mate, and I'm sure that after watching this, that you will notice it next time. Uh, well, on we go. Uh, it's mate pattern number two, and I call that Bowden's mate. Oh, let's have a look at that. This is from a game. Bowden was an old master, so this game is about uh, from about 1895 or something like that. Uh, and Bowden played d5. This is the first known uh, example in the database, I believe, of this mate. And, well, White has to lose a piece here, but he didn't notice uh, Black's threat and he took on d5. And maybe you've seen this before, but if you haven't, then after this you will have surely learned it. Uh, the main uh, idea of the theme is that uh, black, uh, sorry, white's king is very much uh, boxed in by his own pieces here. Uh, the rook and the knight uh, take care of, of this side of the king. And this bishop is, is blocking the king here. So after the simple queen takes c3 check, B takes c3 is absolutely forced, and then we have bishop a3, and this is checkmate, and it's really nice how, uh, how only the bishops are uh, coordinate to uh, to make this mate. Here we have another game. Uh, Black's last move was queen to h5, offering up the exchange of queens. But of course, uh, white denied to exchange queens because, yes, of course, by now you should know. Queen takes c6, check. E takes c6, bishop a6, checkmate. I have some uh, further examples here. Uh, this is a, a game between, actually from Simul, between Alexander Alikain and uh, some guy named Vasic in 1931. And let's just go over this quickly. It's a weird kind of uh, French defense by black. No <laughs> well, and white as, as well actually, but after that gf6, bishop d3. Black played here, b6. Now this is, isn't exactly like uh, the, uh, the position of the king is on uh, c8, but it, it's sort of mirrored. Uh, we still have this uh, these black pieces blocking. We still have this bishop on the diagonal, and well, you must have noticed by now. Queen takes e6 check. Of course, queen e7 we take with mate, but f takes e6 doesn't bring much salvation because we have bishop g6 check mate. Uh, one more example, and this is uh, this is from a game between Jonathan Rawson, who is now a grandmaster, and uh, a guy named uh, Richardson. And his rating is actually uh, 2360. But here he played c takes d4. This idea was well, quite obviously that if White recaptures, he's going to play queen takes e4 check. But my friend Jonathan, he didn't recapture on d4. 
he of course took on e6, recognizing the uh, the Bowden's mate. Bishop g6 checkmate. Okay, I think this is quite clear. So uh, those are my two first mate patterns. Okay, I think I have one more. Yes, it's mate pattern number three, and I call that uh, Stephenson's mate. Hannes Stephenson is an Icelandic Grandmaster, and we'll see an example from his game. Okay, I'm not going to say this. Okay, this is made in its pure form. Uh, well, as you can see, uh, we have very active pieces. The bishops are very active here. Uh, the knight is well placed, and the queen is ready. And indeed, the queen sacrifices itself. Queen takes h5, threatening queen takes h7 mate, and after g takes h5, bishop takes h7 checkmate. Let's look at uh, one example from a tournament game. This is between two amateurs. But uh, White's last move was actually knight from g7 capturing a pawn on h5. Quite probably overlooking queen takes h5. Now there's nothing to be done about the threat of queen h7 mate, but to take this queen. But unfortunately, that allows uh, the step of the mate bishop h7. And on we go. One more example, and indeed that's from the game Stefansson Rousson from the Capablanca Memorial, and. Well, uh, I had seen this made, of course, before in textbooks, but this was the first time I kind of, kind of saw a, a game between very strong players where this happened or occurred. And well, it's that was on the move here. And if you if you want to play queen takes h5 here, then you're paying some attention, but not enough because. We also have to take into account that we have an opponent in chess and our opponent can checkmate us here. So, what did Hannes Stefansson do here? Yes, of course, he played bishop to e4, attacking the queen, stopping the mate on g2, and after uh, black's forced reply, either queen c8 or even if he plays d5. Then we could go ahead with queen takes h5. We are threatening simply queen h7 mate. And well, Bruson resigned here, but of course, if he captures the queen, then bishop takes h7 is checkmate. So, yes, those were our uh, mate patterns for this, uh, for this edition of my pattern recognition program. Uh, It's on to our first tactical pattern, and I call that the undefended bishop on b7 in hedgehog positions. Uh, well this often occurs in the hedgehog, uh, sometimes in the Sicilian. You can get uh, hedgehog like pawn structures in the Sicilian. But the example I've chosen here is from a it's from a game. Uh, this is a common way to try to reach the, reach the head soccer white. e4, intending d4, uh, takes, knight takes. And now we have the head shock. Uh, usually black goes a6, knight b2, d7. But he has to be a little bit careful because after knight b2, d7, uh, which is indeed a mistake. White has a tactical blow here. And have you seen it? White can play here e5. The point of course is that if bishop takes g2, e takes f6, materials equal but the difference is that uh, 
we are threatening to capture two black pieces. So if black would choose this, he would lose a piece. So the best that black can do after this is d takes e5, bishop takes b7, and take on d4. Notice that uh, rook b8, we have knight to c6, which still uh, should win the exchange. So probably this is the best that black can do, uh, d takes c3. And we are up the exchange. Uh, although black has a pawn for it, white has uh, a winning position. Notice in this example after e5 uh, the importance of the presence of the rook on e1. Uh, and I will demonstrate it in our next example. It's very similar, but not exactly the same. Here, white plays e5 immediately. Bishop takes g2, e takes f6. And now, like before, uh, there are two black pieces attack. But this time, uh, he's attacking the rook on f1. But notice that in our earlier example, the rook was on e1. So, what happens here after bishop takes f1? We take Black has to recapture, and king takes f1. And in this instance, we have uh, two pieces for a rook and a pawn. And usually, uh, we prefer the two pieces for the for the rook and the pawn. And in this instance, uh, that's good for white. But again, note the difference. Uh, and the importance of having uh, the rook on e1 instead of f1. Uh, okay, here we have a, a game I played in the Icelandic League last year. Uh, once again, it was a was a Catalan, a weird kind of Catalan actually. Uh, and here I found a forcing continuation. I played e4. He has to uh, retreat the knight. I notice already when I play e4, I have I have spotted the uh, combination, and it's based on this unguarded bishop on b7, and the similarities to uh, the headshot were probably what uh, allowed me to find this combination. And here I played not knight takes f7, but knight to g6, and the importance is that. I am intending e5, of course, uh, exploiting the bishop on b7. And after h takes g6, e5, queen takes d4, I take on f6. I'm attacking two pieces, uh, bishop on b7 and bishop on d6. And uh, the best that black can do here is bishop takes g2. Now I take on e7. If I had originally taken on f7, the black rook would be there now, so uh, this pawn takes e7 wouldn't come with a tempo gain because after bishop takes f1, I take on f8. And I have simply won a piece, haven't I? Uh, okay, I just remembered uh, one extra. Example. I'm just looking it up here. Uh, here it is. Uh, okay, let's just go to the Catalan uh, castles. Castles uh, is after b6 here. Knight uh, c3, bishop b7. Knight e5, c6, e4. If black goes here, knight b to d7. Then we have a very interesting tactic, and the theme essentially is the same, but it's, it's uh, slightly different. 
Knight takes c6, a very nice move. Bishop takes c6. We take. We have to take with the e pawn to uh, open this diagonal. The okay, black takes. Doesn't really matter if he takes, but comes to the same. Bishop has to retreat, and now we go d6, exploiting the undefended bishop on b7. And indeed, after this, d takes e7. With a tempo gain, black has to take. And king takes g2. And white is basically up a pawn for nothing. Let, let's save this little nugget here. Uh, okay. Uh, I think that was the last example. So on we go. And I have a strategical pattern for you. Uh, and I call it a Glicorich's uh, uh, pawn sacrifice. And let's have a look at that. This is a famous game between Alexander Kotov and Svetosar Glikoric. And this is from the Candidates Tournament in uh, Zurich in 1953. A uh, very famous tournament uh, that David Bronstein actually uh, wrote a fam famous book about uh, that people consider uh, to be very good. Just go going to go quickly over the opening here. Uh, queen c2 and in this position uh, and this was probably yeah pretty much groundbreaking because people hadn't done this before uh, here Glicor it's played e4 and what's the idea behind this move the idea is after f takes e4 we go f4 uh, we just gave up a pawn but for what? Uh, first of all, for this wonderful e5 square, which is firmly under control, and for instance, we can put a knight there. Second of all, we have this beautiful diagonal for our bishop here, which can be possibly reinforced by our queen if needed. And also notice that after sacrificing this pawn, this pawn here on e4, it's pretty much uh, blocking in this bishop and the queen. This battery is no longer effective, and it's also taking away a square from this knight. And if this knight can move, then it's even more uh, difficult for this knight to move. So we're kind of uh, sticking it to it, uh, not giving him uh, room to move. So let's see what happened in the game. Bishop f2, knight d7. It's heading for the beautiful blockading square on e5. Uh, now white went knight to g1. Uh, he's intending knight f3 to try to uh, counter the block, uh, blockade on e5. Glicoric uh, went queen to g5. Bishop f1, knight e5. Now he went knight f3. Queen e7, and he managed to exchange uh, one piece here. But notice how, how black totally controls the board. Uh, this blockade uh, is just totally making the white pieces bad, and it's very difficult to play the white position. White castled, key uh, cards. Uh, Decided that his knight on h5 wasn't doing much and decided to bring it back. h3 was played, bishop d7. And now black is just getting ready to uh, open up the queen set with a6 and b5. Uh, and then he can uh, move his rook here and use the battery here of the queen and the bishop to uh, make something decisive happen. Knight b1. Uh, this is actually another interesting moment. He wants to uh, put the knight from d2 to f3, where it uh, disturbs the blockade. But here, Grigoric played a nice move. f3, another pawn sacrifice. White accepted, and now he went back to h5. Uh, 
where there's a new function for this knight blockade on f4 at 92 knight f4 and notice though that no, notice now that this knight no longer has these squares available so it's basically bad and this battery is still very bad and at the bishop f1 and b5 black is much better uh, but it should be added though that somehow uh, cut off managed to to draw this game let's look at a similar example uh, this time we have Gary Kasparov with the black pieces uh, it's not uh, exactly the same position but the theme is the same e4 uh, white took on h5 first and after f takes e4 well what do we do you should know that it's obvious yes we play f4 bishop went to f2 bishop to g4 Probably with this move he's trying to uh, induce white to play h3, which he indeed did, otherwise he can't long castle. And that means that this is an additional black squared weakness here. And black has the has a blockade here, making this bishop very bad, this bishop very strong. And black is ready to attack on the on the queen set. And indeed uh, see how this black bishop on e5 is by far the best piece on the board and despite being down upon it it's black that has all the chances and of course Kasparov won this game all his pieces are coming to life here uh, bishop e5 B2 is threatened, and well, he didn't take the queen with the rook. He took it with the queen, and White finally resent because this is checkmate. A nice game by Kasparov. Okay, uh, but now we come to an interesting game. <laughs> okay, a little bit of self pluck. But this is a game I played myself. Uh, and it's sort of to demonstrate that okay, it's it's all well and good to uh, know these patterns, but really they're no good unless we can somehow use them to uh, help ourselves improve. And indeed, uh, well, let's just go quickly over this. We got uh, well, sort of a King's Indian, uh, a King's Indian type of structure, certainly, but the, uh, the uh, move order was a little bit different and here I believe black has a fine position uh, here my opponent played b4 and now I think I played a fine move and in light of what we have been looking at uh, you should probably know what that move is but anyway, you can take a minute to think about it. Well, of course, I played e4, the Glicoric pawn sack. I am uh, blocking white's pieces, and indeed, this uh, black square uh, blockade is very strong if you're intending to uh, attack on the king set. White played f takes e4, f4. Bishop d4 was played, and I went knight to e5. We see that uh, black has a very clear plan of attack with simply moves like this. Uh, the queen can come over when and if needed, uh, and this bishop will clear the way for this rook to join here. Uh, perhaps this rook has doubled on the fire level already and somehow it will be difficult for white to stop the black attack uh, 
white plate here plus you take z5 that's probably uh, a mini mistake because well this bishop is simply too strong now a further in inaccuracy by my opponent he played h3 and I followed up with f3 not so much a pawn sacrifice because I will get the uh, h3 pawn right away after rook takes, rook takes, pawn takes, bishop takes a3. My pieces are totally coming to life, and he played here king h1. Notice that uh, on f4, I can probably just take it and play queen to g5. when I win, win this piece back and uh, have the bishop pair. So king h1 was played. And I played queen to h4. Although this seems like a strong move, uh, found by the computer afterwards. Uh, and if it takes, we will have a checkmate in a few moves. But queen h4 is logical, uh, threatening all kinds of discovered checks. Uh, rook g1 was played, king h8, queen e1, and after queen f6, my opponent simply resigned. Uh, actually, a pawn down, but he can't do anything to defend. A very nice game. Uh, although, I did have a nice way to finish here with bishop g2. He has a take, knight f4 check, and after knight takes f4, I play rook g8. White has only rook king f1 here, and then I capture on e1, and I win the uh, white queen. And pretty soon the, the rest of white's material, pretty much. But, okay, this little game was uh, pretty much meant to demonstrate that uh, by learning these uh, classic games and uh, accumulating uh, knowledge of patterns, someday, somehow, uh, it will pay up. It will pay dividends, and indeed, it did here. And, well, we can wonder would I have played e4 and won this nice game if I had not known about uh, the game Code of Glee Courage and uh, this sacrifice. Probably not, uh, but we'll never know, but I'm guessing probably not. <laughs> so, okay. What do we have next? Uh, we have a technique pattern, which I call the self-moving rook with uh, two pawns. And what is that? Uh, yeah, let's save it. Well, uh, this is a completely fabricated position by myself, but it's meant to demonstrate uh, how these two pass pawns and this rook don't really need the help of the white king to uh, push themselves because it's uh, this is a completely self-movable uh, object, so to say. And the technique is really simple. Uh, first move, rook b4. We are counting the a4 pawn, black will make some move, we simply play b3. Our next move is rook b5. Then we play a5, b4. After that, b6 where the rook is guarded, and again we push the pawns. Boom, boom. What happens next? The rook goes up, and the pawn comes. Boom, boom. And finally, the rook goes here, and the pawn is ready to promote. Uh, in this sample uh, I made up, uh, I tried to uh, make some counterplay for black, but somehow there is none. A5, G5. Okay, we can play rook, uh, sorry, B4 here, but why not rook B6 with check? 
and after king moves and b4. g4 trying to make counterplay, but after a6, black has to move the king. Because if you go, for instance, uh, g3 here, uh, then we can uh, break up our pattern, and we have this, which is completely winning. So, after a6, uh, the king has to move. So we simply continue with our pattern. Uh, king perhaps tries to join. Uh, okay, king c5. King c4 is not the most critical move, but okay. Move b7. And the pawns are completely being pushed by themselves. And we can even allow this. And finish our pattern here with rook b8. And we are ready to make a new queen here. And there is no counterplay here, we simply bring our king here. And the white wins. Do we have anything more like that? Yes, we have technique pattern number two. And that's the queen ending, uh, with the queen pushing pawn and defending against checks perpetual. What do I mean here? Uh, I'm talking about the position like this, which is I believe quite common. Uh, we have a passed pawn, pawn more, and a queen ending, and you want to push it. Uh, well, there shouldn't be any uh, problem associated with that, but queen b8 check, king h7. Now we play f3. Notice that our queen on the same diagonal as our king and that's really important uh, we can demonstrate that by after f5 making a silly move for white queen to b7 what happens then is simply queen e5 check if we go back check if we interpose, check. This is simply a perpet uh, perpetual. So this silly line demonstrates the importance of having the queen on the same diagonal as the king. Uh, okay, f5 is an attempt at some counterplay by a uh, black, but if uh, black sort of does nothing, then we simply push the pawn. And right here, uh, it's important to play queen to c7, keeping the queen on the same diagonal as the king. And after this, uh, black can do nothing, can do nothing to uh, prevent the promotion of the pawn. If we, on the other hand, uh, push the pawn, and I think this queen c7, don't push the pawn to b7. Go queen c7 and then b7. If you, however, push the pawn here, after queen c6, you have to be a little careful because queen c6 throws the win away. Queen d6 check. What can we do if we go g3? Then we have a perpetual on these two squares. And if you try this, uh, well, nothing can be done. It's a perpetual. So I have in mind this queen c7. So this technique is basically putting the queen on the same file as your pawn and on the same diagonal as your king. Push it to the 6th rank and use the queen, put the c7 and then push the pawn. Okay, let's look at a small attempt at counterplay by uh, black. We push, queen d2, b5, f4. And now, because uh, the queen is not uh, putting pressure on the uh, b pawn, the black queen. We can play queen c7 and then finish up with b6, b7 and make a queen. All we have to look out for is uh, some kind of counterplay here with a perpetual. But our idea is that uh, when the queen moves away, we will take here. So, okay, uh, 
Actually, maybe uh, when looking at this, maybe there are small problems with uh, more like Queen F2. Well, not now because they would take an F4. But when we push B6, that can go Queen F2, threatening this perpetual. Uh, Okay, I'm not gonna leave you hanging, so let's 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 look at this if we make this move. Ah uh, yeah, then we go queen c5 completely winning. Yeah, because then <laughs> then uh, this is a new diagonal of interest really because this one is blocked now. So can black really make a mighty, mighty move here? Uh, queen e3 maybe. And we have check. And if you can put the queen. Well now we can make some checks and then it's, it's no problem. Uh, Yeah, okay. I'm seeing some ghosts. I mean, this is plus nine for the computer. Uh, but basically, this is a good technique to know. Uh, and indeed, I have another example. Uh, when the king is on uh, g2, on the h1 to 8 diagonal. All the same things.